Kako. Welcome to Anahola Baptist Church with Pastor Kenny Elledge. We are searching the Holy Scriptures today, so get your Bible and ekomomai, join us. I've been teaching that chapters 9 through 11 are a section that God has given to us in order to ground us in chapters 1 through 8. And what do I mean by that? Well, chapters 1 through 8 is all about the gospel, which I think is Paul's purpose in the book of Romans is to teach us the gospel. There's nothing more important in the world than the gospel of God concerning Jesus Christ. And he's gone through and he showed us how the, what the gospel is. He showed us how the gospel is applied to sinners, that all are sinners, and how it's applied to us. He's shown us all the benefits of the gospel. To those who are in Christ, innumerable benefits are ours. But all of that depends on God's word being true. If God's word cannot be trusted, then the gospel and all of its benefits and all of its, its glory is not all that good of news. And so in chapters 9 through 11, Paul has been concerned to display that God's word is true. And the way that he's gone about demonstrating that is how God has worked through history, the history of redemption, and he's, asked, he's, he's answered some implicit questions. The first question is, what about Israel? Israel to this day is in large part un, in unbelief. How does that comport with the mercy of God? As we see the majority of your Bible, if you open it, you'll see the first big half of your Bible really regards this nation and God's mercies towards a particular people called Israel. And when Paul is writing this, most of those people are in unbelief in the world. To this day, most of those people are in unbelief. So Paul is showing then how God's word is actually true, even in their unbelief, even to this day. But also, the second issue that Paul is concerned to show, that God's word is true in the salvation of a people who were not a people. The Gentiles, who comprise most of the people in this room today. If you don't have Jewish or Israeli blood in you, then you are a Gentile. And if you are a Gentile, then for the longest time, you had no knowledge and you had no part in the people of God in the world before Christ came. This was normal before Christ came and after Christ has come, all of these things have changed, but Paul has been proving that these things have been changing according to the word of God. And so God's word stands. And so in chapter 11, he continues with this. He continues making this point that God's word has stood even here, but he has also shown and he's in more detail brought out how especially the hardness of Israel has played out, the remnant of Israel that's being saved. He's shown how the hardness of Israel has turned to our salvation as Gentiles. It's through their hardness that the gospel has come to the Gentile peoples in the world. In chapter 11, we see the surprise of God's plan. And here's my take on chapters 9 through 11. The apostle is trying to always keep God's people humble. You see, one of the problems that we see historically is that a people that are blessed are a people that tend towards arrogance. Hum humility is not in our vocabulary as a country these days, is it? Especially humility towards God. But God would have his people always dependent upon him. 
Paul opens chapter 9 describing himself that he would give himself as a sacrifice if it would save Israel. And implied in that is Israel is not saved in large part. And then he goes on to show how great a benefit Israel has received in verses 4 and 5 of chapter 9. And yet all of those benefits, spiritual and earthly, did not abound to their salvation because they were trusting in all of those things and not in the one that all of those benefits showed forth, and that was Jesus Christ. You see, we can become proud in our baptism. We can become proud in our church attendance. We can become proud in our taking part of the Lord's Supper if we are not purely resting in the mercies and the ministry of the Holy Spirit as he applies the grace of God and the gospel to us. And so even in chapter 7, we see Paul surprising us, or God reveal, Paul su revealing the purpose of God in redemptive history through many surprising aspects. First, God has not rejected his people, Israel. You, you know, you think of that nowadays, we have the word of God, but to a Gentile community that at that time, who is probably being persecuted, a majority Gentile community, who is probably being persecuted by the Jews at that time, you're not the true people of God. You believe in a Messiah who's not the Messiah. He even says that in verse 28 of chapter 11. They are enemies, he says, of the Jews. Now, they're enemies towards us. And so, but he begins this chapter by saying, but God has not rejected them. Wait, they're enemies towards us, God's people, but God has not rejected them? That's a surprise. In fact, the way that God has not rejected them, we see even down to this very day, is there's a re remnant of Israel. There's a remnant being saved. And so there's a second way that, that we're surprised by God's redemptive history in this chapter, and that the Gentiles are included into the people of God, into the very same redemptive symbol, this tree that Israel and the true Israel belong to, the roots, the very roots of the tree being described as the patriarchs of Israel, I believe here. And we belong now to this very same redemptive category of God's people. The Gentiles are included by grace because of the hardness of Israel and their unbelief. And the third surprise, as we'll see today, and we've seen it already implied several times through verses 11 through 24, is that there is going to be a time where there is what Paul says, a full inclusion or an acceptance or a grafting back into this redemptive tree of Israel there's going to be a time where Israel, that is Israel as a people, as a visible entity, comes into this standing of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the one whom they have rejected for so long. And this all happens according to the word of God. And so I have really one point this morning, and that's this. All Israel will be saved. Verses 25 through 27. I'm going to read those verses again. I want to draw your attention to one thing the apostle says right off the bat. Lest you be wise in your own sight. Listen to what he says here. I do not want you to be unaware. Now when we see those types of insertions in scripture, it means this. Let me have your attention. He's writing a letter we split them up into 16 chapters, and you know how it's like when you're reading something, you're just going and all of a sudden you're distracted about this or that. He's writing this to get our attention. What we are going to study today, he's putting in bold, or an exclamation point upon this. Do not be unaware of what? This mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles have come in, has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Notice the pronouns, first of all. Notice the pronouns as we begin in verse 25. 
He uses you and your here. And this goes back to verse 13, where it's very clear that he's speaking to Gentile believers in this context with the you and the your pronouns. They and their, he's speaking to Israel, of Israel in general. But you and your are Gentile believers here. He's speaking in most part to Gentile believers. I do not want you to be aware, unaware of this mystery. And notice Paul's purpose then for Gentile believers, especially as follows. First, that we not be wise in our own sight. Alternatively, that we be humble by what he is going to teach us. So his purpose, the purpose of his pointing out, hey, listen up, be attentive to what I have to say, and all that follows is our humility, Gentile believers. And this hails back to the humility that he already told us of, that we are an olive branch, a wild olive branch, as it were, that have been grafted into a cultivated olive tree. And he wants us to be aware that our place in that olive tree then is by grace. Chapter 9, we are saved by the mere mercy of God. By the mere grace of God, we have been included into this olive tree. We had no part in this. We could have never said to God at the day of judgment, Hey, we're Gentiles. We have a right to our salvation. No, this is point is you're a wild olive tree. You had no part in this by natural right. Nothing in you could have made you boast in your salvation and you had no right to it but God's mercy alone. And so there's no place for boasting. He says in verse 18, here's one of the results of that. Do not be arrogant toward the branches. And those branches are the natural branches of that olive tree that were cut off. And what he's meaning there is those who are in this saving grace of God do not boast over those of Israel who are not. That's something that we need to take, take stock in already at this point. To the shame of many Gentile believers over the course of the Christian church of the last 2,000 years, some have not merely despised Israel but some have sought their persecution. Christians have sought the persecution of Jewish people, whether or not they were guilty of crimes, but because they were Jews, but because they were Israelites. And Paul is teaching here a humility that we should abhor such, such histories of the Christian church, such actions of Gentile believers. Here's a little bit more context as to the measure of the humility Paul is calling us to as Gentiles. In verse 28 of chapter 11, he says, As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. He, who is he speaking of there? He's speaking of Israel. Of Israel in general at this time that he's writing and now to this very day. If you... If you're privy to the world of believing Jewish people, Hasidic Jews or Orthodox Judaism, there are many veins in there that go back to this very same attitude that the Jewish people in this day had towards the Christians of this day, those who were followers of the way. They did not merely, they were not sharing space with them as a pluralistic society. They certainly were, weren't syncretistic towards Christians. Neither were the Christians towards them. They saw Christians as enemies, robbers of their faith, taking their Messiah, their idea of the Messiah, to themselves, one that they had no right to. And they were enemies of those Christians. But listen to what he says of them, of these Israelites. They are enemies for your sake, but as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. You mean these people that in Jerusalem were driving out Christians, driving them to, to poverty that was so great that, as we looked at last week, that the Macedonian churches who were in severe affliction and severe poverty were giving to the Jerusalem church because Jewish people so despised the Christians in Jerusalem. You mean those kind of enemies, they're loved for the sake of their fathers? 
These are massive categories that reveal to us how deeply our humility ought to be towards Israel. So this humility that is born in us is born in us because of what Paul will reveal here. And secondly, his second purpose in all of this is so that we will be hum humbled as he reveals a mystery. Look at, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. In the New Testament, a mystery is something that is not steamed in some kind of... Uh, uh, Twilight Zone kind of aura, like, ooh, a mystery, you know, like you get tingles on your back every time you say the word, right? Or some hush comes over the crowd, ooh, this is a mystery. A mystery has much more to do with actually what's being revealed in the New Testament than what's hidden. But it does refer to what was previously hidden. And what's mysterious about what Paul is saying is not that it's going to happen, but in the way that it's going to happen. He's talking about a mystery. He says, he describes it here as a mystery. Actually, let's look what a definition, a helpful definition of what a mystery is in Romans 16, 25, at the end of verse 25 and 26. This is almost a definition of a New Testament mystery here. He says, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed or revealed through the prophetic writings and has been made known to all nations. You see there, what's most emphatic about the mystery is the revealed nature of it. It's been disclosed, it's been made known, and that's what we're dealing with here. This mystery is something he's teaching us. He wants us to know it, and here it is. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Now, I want us to be reminded that the conclusion of understanding this mystery is what? Is our humility as Gentile believers. But let's take a closer look. He says, a partial hardening. Partial here means numerical. And we've already seen what this means back in verse 7 through 10 in chapter 11. What then? Israel failed to attain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it. What they were seeking was the righteousness of God. They failed of it because they were trying to gain it by works. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. The elect believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The rest were hardened. And there is where this partial hardening is displayed. There's a remnant of believers, but the rest were hardened. But there's more than just a numerical hardening here. A partial hardening in the sense of numerically speaking, Israel is for the most part in unbelief. We also see there's a chronological partial part to this hardening. He says a partial hardening has come upon Israel until there's a time where this hardening will cease. This, this partial numerical hardening will cease until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. So Dr. Tom Schreiner says this in his commentary, and he's right to say it. A part of Israel is hardened for a limited period of time. Now this is taking place currently. Even today, there's very small part of Israel which are believing. But this until signifies that there will be a time in the future still, because we don't see it take place yet, this signifies that there is a time when this will change. This partial hardening numerically will give way. That future time will coincide with what he says going forward in the mystery, the fullness, the pleroma of the Gentiles. What Paul reveals in this mystery is that at some future time, the full number of elect Gentiles will come to fruition. The elect will have believed among the Gentiles, after which the until describes, after which the partial hardening of Israel will be removed. And the effect of this removal of Israel's hardness is set forth. We don't have to guess. Well, what does it mean when that partial hardening is lifted? He says in verse 26, it's part of this mystery, and in this way, that's the mystery, in this way, all Israel will be saved. That is, 
There remains in God's saving purpose a future time for a mass conversion of Israel such that they will be known in general by their faith in Christ, not their hardness and unbelief. When we think of Israel today, when you think of them as a people, they are not believing. In general, the vast majority of Israel to this very day are in unbelief. And what Paul is saying, when the last Gentile believes, at some point in God's mind, this will mean that there will be a mass of faith, a mass of conversion among Israel such, Israel, such that they will be known as believers in Jesus Christ. This is what he's teaching here. Now it's important that we understand this term all Israel, and we'll look at this a little bit more as we go along. But we should understand this as being limited towards those that come after the fullness of time. There are some that have tried to teach that this all Israel here means all Israel regardless of time. So that God will in fact go back and retro save all who have already died of Israel in hardness. And to believe that you have to sort of believe that all those who are of Israel who are not of the true Israel in chapter 9, 6, are in some sort of a intermediary state, some sort of a limbo state, that they can still be saved by some future mercy of God being applied to them. I don't think this is what Paul is teaching by any means. This is certainly not what all of Scripture teaches. In fact, Christ, if you'll remember in chap chapter 8 of Matthew, verse 11 and 12, I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. That east and west, those are Gentiles. Many will come of the Gentile nations. They're going to recline with Isaac and Jacob. They're going to have fellowship. Saving fellowship is what he means. While the sons of the kingdom, the natural branches, Israelites, will be thrown out into outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. No doubt a reference to eternal judgment, to hell. Second here, all Israel, he, I, I take as a majority. I don't mean, I don't take Paul to mean here that all Israel means every single Israelite at the end of day. He doesn't say all Israelites will be saved. He says all Israel. And that's a very natural and oftentimes used general description of the people of God without meaning every one of them individually. What I think we should understand from here is that at this time, all Israel will be saved such that they will be known in general to be God's people. It will be known of Israel that they belong to God in faith in Jesus Christ. But like every other fundamental argument that Paul has taught already in chapters 9 through 11, I want to, I want to remind you that chapters 9 through 11 of Romans contain one-third of all of his quotations of the Old Testament in all of his writings. All of his writings. Paul is grounding these truths in Scripture. Verse 26 and 27, he says, and he quotes Isaiah 59, 20 and 21, here in verse 26, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. The deliverer will come from Zion. Who is that deliverer? It's Christ. It's Jesus. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. Jacob there is a reference to Israel. Verse 27, and this will be my covenant when th with them when I take away their sin. And most believe, most commentaries believe or speak that the apostle is referencing the Septuagint here in Isaiah 59, 20 and 21 and Isaiah 29 and verse 7. Now, some object to this, and they say, but the Deliverer came already from Zion, remember? Didn't we just celebrate Christmas? Didn't Christ come? Didn't He already accomplish the deliverance of His people? And they'll say, yes, He, he accomplished that already at His first coming. We will be saved now when we believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So they say what Paul is referencing here is that Christ has already come and the salvation that has come has come for those who believe in him now. But, and so they say that this cannot be merely relegated to a future mass conversion of Israel. But I think that that argument is easily removed since Paul is referring to Israel's future salvation happening before Christ returns. You see, what Paul is referencing here is the same way that you and I are saved through Jesus Christ, through his coming. This is the way this mass of Israel will be saved through his saving Jacob at this time. He's using these texts to show that this is yet to come for this mass of Israel, for Israel's return to their God through Jesus Christ. You see, even today, even in the Christian church in the past hundred years, there have been those scholars who have tried to say that at this time, yes, there will be a mass conversion of Israel, but God will save them through some special means for the Jewish people alone. In other words, they will not have to be saved through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, what liberalism did in the last century, German liberalism, and by that I mean liberalism as in theological liberalism is they try to make everybody savable through any sort of means because they didn't want to leave anyone out they want everybody pluralistically syncretistically to find their own way as long as they're sincere they're going to come to god well the jews they they saw well the new testament is anti-semitic you see that's what they would teach it's anti-semitic and so what Paul is teaching here is that at the end of the age, all Israel will be saved by some other means than Jesus. And what they try to say is in chapter 11, there's nothing explicitly said of Jesus here. That they don't have to have a faith in Jesus at this end time. They'll, they'll, God will save them through some other means. He'll be their people just like they were in the Old Testament. But see, I think Paul is referencing this, these two texts here to show, no, it's through the one who comes from Zion. It's through Christ that they are saved. Beloved, there is no salvation in any other name. There is no salvation. Don't ever let anybody tell you it's mean to tell a people group from around the world that they must believe on Jesus Christ in order to be saved. That is the only name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And that is good, and that is loving to tell your neighbor. Salvation only comes through Christ. And this is amazing to read, isn't it? At the end of the age, before Christ comes, his people, this people, Israel, this formerly this remnant will turn into a massive ingathering of Israel to the glory of God. Now, this is not, that interpretation from this text is not without objection. It's not without objections. And some of these objections we need to take very seriously. These are objections that come within the household of faith from our brothers and sisters. From a text that teaches us humility, there is often not a lot of humility that comes when we gather around and we talk about these texts together. Ah, uh, I'm right, you're wrong, and then that's it, you're out. <clears throat> I want us to consider some of these objections because I think as we consider them, they'll help us understand, I think, <laughs> let me say this, in humility, that I think this interpretation that I'm giving you today is the right one. But I want us to see what the objections are so that we can weigh them out. First, I'll just take three basic objections. First, Paul isn't limiting this mystery to what is merely future, some say. And, and by that, they mean to say that there is no, we shouldn't consider this as some after the fullness of the Gentiles come in as there will be an end of God's people being saved as the Gentiles and then this mass of Israel being saved. That, that's not what Paul is saying. And, and the reason why they say that is because down in verse 30 and 31, we read, for just as you at one time were disobedient to God, that is the Gentiles were disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, that is Israel. So they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, 
they also may what? Now receive mercy. In my view, this is the strongest argument against the interpretation that there is a massive future in gathering of Israel after the fullness of the Gentiles. But I'm not finally persuaded by this. They, they rightly say now many have they are receiving mercy. That is Israel now receive mercy. But we already know several times in this text, all the way back to chapter 9, we already know that there is now a remnant of Israel being saved. God has already taught that even now they are mercifully being saved, although a remnant, a remnant of them are. And Paul even says in chapter 11 that it's his purpose to exalt his ministry to the Gentiles in order to make Israel jealous so that through that some of them might be saved now. And so it shouldn't surprise us to see that now they already are receiving mercy through the way and the, through the purpose that God is being merciful to Gentiles. Also, now can be used as a general term of chrono chronology. That is, Paul might mean that now means in this age. Now, when we, understand of God's when we understand God's saving purposes, we speak of them as within categories of his revealed will. So now we live in this age of redemption, this age of gospel proclamation, this age of getting the gospel out and, and witnessing of Christ and making disciples of all nations and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But there is an age to come. That age is being described at the second coming of Christ when all of that gospel proclamation will roll over into Christ returning, receiving his people unto himself and then coming in judgment and in power. And this age of gospel proclamation and the church being gathered in through grace and through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ will give way to his coming. It will give way to his judging of the earth and making all things new. And so sometimes the term now can be in reference to the age that we live in. And so he could say here, may now receive mercy in this age before Christ returns. We could take it to mean that. But also, I believe the weight of the rest of the text that we see both prior to verses 25 and 26 and 27 from verse 11 on, on down lead me to say and to understand that this is not finally an objection that convinces me that there won't be a future outpouring of mercy on Israel. The second objection that we see to that future outpouring of mercy upon the mass of Israel is that in verse 5 we read, So too at this present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. And by that all Israel will be saved means all of the elect of Israel will be saved. You see, some take this to mean that at the end of the fullness of the Gentiles will come the end of God saving a remnant unto himself so that at that time all Israel will be saved. So that there's this consistent saving of a remnant until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. That speaks of this age of grace that we live in. And then all Israel will be saved in that manner. The problem with that view primarily is that that doesn't humble any Gentile believers whatsoever. That doesn't leave us to any humility. What Paul is saying here, remember, primarily leads to our humility. And then also, there's more to be objected, objected to it in this third objection. Others still see this phrase, all Israel will be saved, as referring to the church as a whole. Now, if we take Paul's argument just from Romans, the book of Romans, we would be admitted to use such a phrase. All Israel would be saved as resulting in all of God's people being saved. How do I say that? If you go back to chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, you will read that no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly. Inwardly is the way that the difference, the distinction is made. And this is the same salvation, the same way of salvation described to the Gentiles. Indeed, in chapter 3, God is the God of the Gentiles and the Jews. Not just the Gent Jews only, but the, G the Gentiles also. In chapter 4, Abraham is the father not of the Jews only, 
but also of the Gentiles. Abraham is both of our father. In fact, our inheritance is the same. We will both receive the inheritance promised to Abraham. Chapter 9, verses 6 through 8, we read that it is not just the people that are born of Abraham, physically speaking, who are the children of God. It was the people of promise, and we are said to be that. Gentile believers in verses 24 through 26. As we who were not a people are now a people of God. Romans chapter 10, verses 11 through 13 say that all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And there is no distinction. Jesus is the Lord of both the Jew and the Gentile. And then we read in chapter 11, verses 17 through 24, this grand view this symbol of redemptive history and the redemptive people of God, that there is one tree of redemption. And the Jews and the Gentiles alike who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and those who were before Jesus abide in that same tree. However, the use of this term, all Israel will be saved, to describe Gentiles among Israel, I don't believe is appropriate here. And there's two primary reasons. First, remember it's for the sake of the Gentile believer's humility, he said, that he teaches us this mystery. He's making a distinction between you and Israel, the all Israel that will be saved here. It's for our humility that we learn that they be saved in mass in this way. The humility we are to have must not boast over the cut off branches. This is Paul's concern all the way back to verse 18. The knowledge that God will only one, that will one day, he will one day graft Israel back into the tree of redemption ought to humble us because this comes at the end of his purposes in the salvation of Gentiles. This shows us, beloved, that we are not saved because we are Gentiles. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here. Do you remember how Paul started chapter 9? All of the benefits that came to Israel, remember that? And that in, apart from Jesus Christ, none of those benefits, benefits them for salvation. Well, let me say this to us. His purpose in giving us this humility and humbling us here is so we would never boast in all of our benefits. We would never boast that, hey, we're Gentiles. God's going to save us. He doesn't want us to fall in the same way that Israel fell in their pride. God had reached out to them. How had he done so? Because they were Israelites? No, because he's a merciful God. Because he's gracious. Because he's full of steadfast love. And we can never expect, we can never depend on a God to save us the way God saves sinners when we begin to boast in ourselves. He doesn't want us to fall in that same pride. And so it's not our Gentile nature that has led God to save us. It's not that we are Gentiles that God has saved us. Secondly, the context here from verse 11 on down to our text leads us to believe that there will be a future outpouring of saving grace upon Israel. Now, he says in verses 11 through 26, three very important things, and we'll move through these quickly and then we'll, be, we'll finish up. We'll wrap it up. He says this, of Israel. And of Israel, this Israel is Israel in unbelief. Now, if their trespasses, verse 12, means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Israel's full inclusion mean. Now, verse 15. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean? Their rejection now, their acceptance mean from li but life from the dead. Which I mean is, is an exalt exalted statement, a, a statement of joy. It's going to be a, a means of rejoicing to see Israel come in mass to the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ. 
Verse 23, and even if they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, that's Israel, they will be grafted in, for God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree, and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these natural branches be grafted back into their own olive tree? So what I'm saying is all of that from verse 11 down to verse 24 is preparing us for what Paul is saying. That at the conclusion in the fullness of the Gentiles, when that has come in, when the last Gentile has faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, when the last elect of the Gentiles comes and, and believes the gospel, all Israel will be saved. Meaning, there will be a mass conversion of Israel, which would be a sight to see. Wouldn't that be a sight to see? But, but here's what Paul is doing in all of this. He's trying to take away that's not the way I do it. <laughs> yeah. The way that he describes God's work in history and redemption is not the way that we do it. Why would you harden a people in order to save a people? You're going to harden this people in order to save the Gentile people. You're going to save a remnant of this people in order to save the Gentiles. In order to save the Gentiles, you're going to make them jealous to save some more of them. You're going to save some of them to make it known that you will always have a remnant until this day. At the end of your saving of the Gentiles, you will save a mass of them. This is how God saves sinners. And you know what it's all for? It's all for us to shut our mouths at ourselves and say, we do not know the mind of the Lord. We were not his counselor in all of this. We did not give to him anything that we should be the recipients of the grace that he's given to us. It's for us who know Christ and who know his mercy to say, wow, look at how God has worked to save us from our sins. And look how he will work. And to shut your mouth and to worship God as God. This is the purpose for chapters 9 through 11 in Romans, is to shut our mouths and say blessed be the name of the Lord this is how Paul ends this chapter and this is how we'll end this week from him through him and to him are all things and at the end of the age at the end of history every one of us will know that's true to him be glory forever Amen. Let's